the CEO and curator at MLAV. Together with Miko Bass of Cisco, he co-created the Refugee First Response Center, an award-winning medical clinic container that features more than 50 languages via video live stream by more than 700 interpreters. He's passionate about, passionate about meaning and technology, the future of exponential technologies, and its opportunities for society, brands, and entrepreneurs. Before that, he co-founded Smato, a pioneering mobile advertising company headquartered in San Francisco, where he was chief marketing officer for seven years. Smato was recently acquired by a Chinese media company. He's not only a thought leader, but also a digital leader. Please welcome Mr. Harold Neidhardt. So I'm trying to tell you a little bit of a story how we created something with this, uh, I think, more meaningful than, let's say, a new Facebook for cats or left-handed cats or whatever micro little new apps we can come up with. Because obviously, when we are run digital innovation, there are so many things you can do and uh, you know, everybody is their own target group. But I think there are some people around us and humanity uh, as a whole um, is basically demanding us that uh, we think a little bit harder how we can help in uh, the solutions which is needed and which can bring us all forward. So I want to talk about exponential technologies as everybody out here, but uh, really think um, how we can apply this for the future. And uh, who is aware of the uh, STD? It's like a really uh, stupid um, uh, three-digit uh, name, but uh, Sustainable Development Goals. People have heard about it, the grand challenges and so on. So I think this is really what it's at. Um, we um, met Katerina and uh, uh, Monty recently at Davos, and uh, you think this is such a big uh, event, and there's so many global leaders, and it's only about big politics, but there's a lot of um, NGOs and uh, UN um, actions as well. And so there's a big combination of where big money can also do uh, you know, good, and where a lot of big leaders are around some of these challenges are addressed and uh, helped and you have you know actors and these people around to give attention so then that seems so grand and so big that you say ah oh, you have this international aid organizations and governments everybody take care of it but uh, i cannot really do anything i'm sitting at my desk and what can i do i go home at five and uh, have to take off care of my family and so on but i think every uh, single one of us can really do something in innovating uh, in the area where we are. And this is really the story I wanted to share with you. So, you know, there's health, water, food, all these big challenges. I want to talk about health. And on the other hand, we heard about all the different uh, exponential technologies, and I could go deep in each one of them, but, you know, we have AI and robotics and uh, computing and nanotech, biotech. All of these things are so tremendously innovative uh, at the same time. And I think if we take both of them together, addressing real challenges and taking these technologies, we can really create something like a Cambrian explosion of ideas which really makes something meaningful. And uh, so if we solve for not X, but for good, then this combination, for example, where we take health and IT, something I want to take um, talk as a story and just frame it in a, let's say, this technology and digital field, but let's talk about people. So. Um, <clears throat> I got a call somewhere around uh, end of August 2015 from Mirko, my friend at Cisco, and he said, Harold, we got to do something. There's all these refugees coming. Uh, I think I can get um, a couple of Wi-Fi routers. We can put them at some of the Home Depots, um, uh, you know, Baumarkt in, in Hamburg, and they all want, need to go on WhatsApp, and we got to help. Oh, do you have a big idea? We need a big idea. And I don't know how about you when you heard about FIRST and got to experiences. I you know, had my deadlines, and I... I didn't really know about refugees. I was like, yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, let me get back to you, of course. But I didn't really, had no idea. Because, you know, you'd work, everybody works in different things. But now your lens changed. You look at TV different way. You see kids on the beach uh, the wrong way around. Uh, you see all the people on the trains. And uh, people arrive. And I was at the Hamburg main station. There was a tent, medical tent, no floor in it. And uh, there was a little, like a, you know, a triage bed uh, where you had uh, the doctor coming in between 12 and 1 in his uh, lunch break. And on the right, uh, you saw some blue gloves. And on the left, you had an uh, orange defibrillator, similar color. So here, welcome to Germany. It's like, 
we cannot do this. I mean, we can do much better in service, but also it's not really decent and uh, not humane and so on, and not, not even talk about sterilize, um, you know, sterile environment, but it's also not a good working environment for the doctor. So uh, I, I said to Mirko, hey, we got to do something. Let's build a clinic. Don't you know, forget the, the, the Wi-Fi. We can put Wi-Fi in there as well, but why don't we take, and this sketch you can see a little bit, is basically what we hashed out overnight, and then he sent it to his uh, people. Um, his immediate boss said, oh, yeah, great. Uh, what do you mean? What's to go to market? Is this a product? Are we selling this now? Uh, what's the price? What, what do you, what, you know, what's pricing if we do 10? Or what, what, so basically, no. <laughs> and um, so then they had also a WhatsApp group, and um, basically they, uh, he, he posted it there. Next day, uh, Michael Ganza, um, somebody in the wife, in the uh, basically, big up uh, v, vice president. He said, "Hey, I'm sitting here with my team. I love it. Let's do it. What do you need?" So that was September uh, 18th, and six weeks later, from that sketch and from that okay, we had uh, the professor from the University Clinic of Hamburg operating in one of these clinics. So, and from the six weeks, four weeks, we had to wait for the container because everybody was doing containers. So here you see a, a situation where inside of, uh, of the container, you have Professor Scherer from the University Clinic of um, Eppendorf in Hamburg and um, you know, refugee, a new local, basically. And um, you see on the side, I don't know if there's a pointer here, but you see the monitor, and there's a live translator, a real person. It's not some you know, automatic thing, but basically somebody from that context, from that language, and also... Um, you know, translating live. So um, the normal way is that you come into maybe a clinic like this and you have four translators for the main four languages, Arabic, you know, Urdu, Pashto, Farsi, the new German dialects, and uh, the people sitting there and uh, sitting on the bench and you come in maybe with your, you know, husband and your, you know, kids crying and so on. There's four people, there's a doctor with maybe, so it's like 18 people in the same room. Not 18, but you get the clue. And uh, so here, this is a just more normal situation. You have um, you know, somebody beaming in. And we work together um, with a company called SAVD in Vienna. And uh, they have 750 live translators, interpreters, sitting in you know, various with a, at home and offices and so on. And they can beam in and say, oh, I need Pashto now. And actually, could I have a female as well? So we can beam them in, uh, they're live there for five or ten minutes, and then during the normal conversation, the doctor says, okay, what's your problem, um, you know, and how, you know, how does it uh, occur, um, what's the circumstances, anything else, and so on and so forth. So after five or ten minutes, you can speak, and uh, the language basically is solved, and you can really communicate about the problem. So... Um, this has worked pretty well. Uh, the city was engaged, the university clinic was engaged, and so we came up, this is uh, Mirko here, uh, after these first six weeks, put this all together, put it there in the camp, and uh, it was ve very well received. Just two weeks later, we had um, a very high visit from the Otto family, and they said, hey, we want to do also something, we want to help. And uh, so they looked at the, the city, said, hey, you know, why don't you look at the container? after a visit of a mom with a kid who really came in like this, and uh, after three minutes talking to uh, you know, somebody in her, in her language, she just opened up and said, oh yeah, this is what's happening. Basically, they, they really engaged, and so they donated 10 medical containers, and they were bigger, 30 foot, and uh, more waiting room and so on, so you see a lot of uh, like where people uh, and Mrs. Otto in the middle, and everybody's happy. The Red Cross got the donation. And uh, so now over the next three years, we have 10 of these units are now installed in Hamburg. And uh, so out of the little idea and the little sketch, basically, in the first uh, unit, uh, which Cisco helped us, we have now 10 units and the next level up, basically, um, and installed in Hamburg. And uh, there's really a pretty happy family. And... Um, so now we said, well, this is really cool. Let's expand and let's tell the story. So um, pretty small logos here. You cannot see it. but um, So we got a couple of awards. Just recently, a Bayer Aspirin um, Innovation Award for Social Impact um, got around to uh, present. Uh, we, were, we were mentioned in one of the reports from Richard Branson's team from B Team to the, with the elders about the refugee crisis, one of the top 10 global innovation awards or corporate engagements and all the nine other um, companies are basically Fortune 100, Accenture, Google, LinkedIn, um, UPS and so on and so forth and our um, Refugee First Response Center. 
together with Cisco. So nice uh, media attention as well, but we also had the chance, we moved the box one day to um, for the Singularity University opening lab in um, Eindhoven and uh, Queen Maxima was there, so we could show it to her as well. And then also Penny Pritzker, the former um, US Secretary of Commerce, was also visiting Hamburg uh, on a smart city tour and was impressed by this thing. So this is all great and nice, but I thought, okay, this is cool, we can help in Hamburg. And you know, as you know, now it's, it's not so many uh, people are arriving anymore. But uh, so I said, okay, let's go and we, ha we have to go where the really trouble is. So our dream is to see, can we scale it from Hamburg and now bring it into the world? So the last November, we actually were lucky that we could bring uh, two containers, one into Greece. This is basically the first pilot which we had in Hamburg. Uh, it's now in, getting installed in a, a refugee camp in Greece, which is was it's actually a military prison designed for 650 people. There's now more than 1,200 people living in there. It's, it's a really horrible situation. And also the medical situation is not so well. So with, together with um, Paula Schwartz, who is very active there in Samos, she invited us to see, hey, can we help? And so we, with the help of Cisco in Greece and their um, employees there, they, we're actually getting this installed so that we have also translation and video, other video, video service like telemedicine. Because you are on an island, you are in a camp. I mean, how... Um, is, uh, how hard is that? And so you don't find a lot of specialists. So we want to see how can we bring specialist people to these services. But then even more, we went to uh, Lebanon in the next week and uh, also beginning of November and saw the second containers, which is now uh, installed uh, in Bika Valley. That was 20 miles from the Syrian border. And spending a day there was really mind blowing, if you will, or really um, you think twice about your. Uh, where your compass is heading, uh, because I think we can really engage much more. And you have an idea that you say, hey, again, like there's these international organizations you have since 20 years, since I don't know how many years, you have international crisis, and they must have to have it down. You know, there was a big $6 billion sponsorship um, aid uh, conference at Cameron, you know, beginning of last year, $6 billion, and most of it was supposed to be spent on the Syrian crisis within, a, you know, basically this time. But if you go into one of these camps, um, you know, you drive a street, uh, whatever. It's, uh, <laughs> it's really <laughs> crazy. You, you drive two minutes and there's like 15,000 people around you uh, in, in, in one street, which is basically more than all of the UK took in for to helping them. And there's more than 1.2, 1.5 million refugees on the Libyan border in Libyan and Lebanon. And obviously, there are only 4 million. So that's really, a, you know the story. So we, we see that we, we collaborated with um, a local NGO and again with Cisco locally um, beyond, which have 86 local um, medical stations and they're supported by UNICEF. And this is, you know, this tent is the same thing. They use it for a school or they also use it for a doctor's office. And this is like, a, you know, five, four millimeter plastic. And now they also have minus 10 and minus 16 degrees uh, there. It's I mean, it's unbearable. And you cannot really understand why, you know, if this, they have a big, nice uh, logo on it, UNICEF, but this is not what we thought that it's, they're helping. So I was really frustrated, and I think that even encourages us more. So and say, okay, once we have installed the first one in Greece and the first one in Lebanon and get the, the doctors uh, up and running, our goal is really can we scale to 10 in Lebanon, 10 in Greece, but we really want to do 100 clinics if we can. And uh, there's still a lot of migration going on. Obviously, they cannot really go up to uh, maybe Germany anymore or Sweden or so. Um, but they're still stuck in Greece. Greece alone is, was prepared for 20,000 people. Now they have more than 60. Uh, um, Lampedusa, Italy is a hot road. Everybody from, you know, a lot of people from Libya go over this way. So there's a more shift this um, way. And so we want to see if we can bring clinics to where help is needed most, very local. And that's why we use container, because you can put it on a boat, you can put it on a truck and bring it down there and uh, see if we can adapt the use cases. And here's what we want to really see. Is there let's sort of a, what our next 2.0 version is exactly what um, Eric uh, just mentioned. There's so many new cool technology, which is maybe a fraction of the cost of what, you know, maybe a blood lab was before a million dollars. Now you have blood labs on a chip for maybe oh, 50,000. And you have x-rays, which uh, before was a super specialist who can only operate it. Now you have x-rays or ultrasound machines, which are a fraction of the cost, and a nurse could do it. Or 
let's say, a doctor without border person. So we try to engage with the local NGOs who already have the staff, but see, can we bring you know, the, the best and the latest of the technology in a package that it's sort of safe and secure, also isolated, can also be heated and uh, help there. And so our dream is really, can we bring 100 clinics? If we have 100 clinics, we can do about 1,000 medical exams a month. And uh, so with you know, 10 months, um, in a year and 100 of them, we can do about a million um, patients a year. And uh, it's not really, um, maybe it's not really much uh, if you have seen more than 60 million people on the go. And, and uh, this is also possible for rural areas, not only for migrants and refugees. But I think this is something which is some, we can do. Um, you can do it with a big company. And here is the same thing. You're, you're sitting at a desk. You have maybe an idea. You propose it to your boss. Your boss says, ah, no, we don't want to talk about it. And then you have a choice, you know. Uh, okay, boss doesn't like it, let's do something else. Or after you have maybe three ideas which you proposed and the boss says, ah, not this year, not this budget, not this quarter. Then, you know, after your fourth idea, you basically go at five, go golfing, have a family life and go away. And I think that's wrong. I think we have to, every one of us here can see, can I push either my company or leave the company or what can I do with them on my desk? You know, what can I do to push my people? Everybody knows somebody who can help in one way, whether it's with funding, whether it's with money, whether it's with influence, press, or something. And I think this is what we try to do. So, but we are now, um, as Eric also mentioned, is a real complicated uh, ecosystem because we, are not, we don't have a buyer, basically. So the UNs and the IOMs of the world, uh, you think, hey, there's, again, this is six billion dollars. Somebody got to buy clinics. And uh, if we not have the right product, they can maybe give us feedback. So, ah, if you change this and we have a, one extra window or something, then you fit the criteria. But uh, it's very hard to cross this um, project. And so we will, our route is to go to private donations um, and, and foundations, get the first installed, and then basically show the UN and uh, UNHCR and all these huge organizations uh, while we're at it that uh, they can help in, us and adapt. So how could you help? If you have any idea, if we want to do the next 10, for example, in Greece, and you know somebody who has uh, 10 medical uh, benches for us or you know IKEA furniture or anything else, um, we have the support of Cisco, so they will help us with equipment. We need transportation. Obviously, we need some funding. And um, we created an NGO um, for this so that we basically just see if we can organize it, put people together, put it on a boat, and then bring it to this local thing. And we have started with the health, and that's the most pressing, pressing issue, but we have also contact with the uh, UN uh, World Food Program, and we start to explore whether also we can use containers for vertical farming, which obviously you know it's used for this, but see if we can also make it connected. And once there's a connection, um, also use it, for example, for schooling and for other uh, ideas, you know, upgrade them with uh, solar roof for uh, different energy options and so on. So we want to see if we can increase this, collaborate with universities, smart people, startups, and say what other new technologies can we put in so that we really kind of help the energy of the nurse or who has a, a lo local volunteer um, in these uh, remote areas, in these dangerous areas, and say, hey, if you were there, um, let's see if we can beam an expert in. Maybe we have Watson at one point and some AI in there as well, but the little devices and the new technologies, which might not even have an FDA approval just for some you know, form, basically, I think here's a big chance also for companies and startups to you know, not only do good, but also do testing and, and get um, research uh, done and so on. So my question is, are you with us to help us or create other ideas? And I encourage you to think on your behalf and your company, whether you start, uh, are in a startup, finance startups, or new innovation, or you're in a big organization, um, what kind of innovation can you do to bring and address some of the global grand challenges? And hey, we're an innovation agency. We have a co-working space from 35 containers. So I have just a passion for containers. Uh, the opportunity or the challenge presented itself by a call from my friend from Cisco. He had luckily the opportunity to steer some uh, CSR money towards this project, and then it started. So I think if we can, uh, let's say, put a little stone in the water, uh, just in this very odd combination, I bet half of the room have even better connections, more access to funding, more access to a network, and uh, we can do all good things together. So thank you for that.